At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part 1. The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You will hear a woman being interviewed by a market researcher in a health club about her membership of the club. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Oh, excuse me. I wonder if you'd have the time to take part in some market research. Um, what's it about? About this club and your experiences and opinions about being a member. It'll take less than five minutes. Oh, OK then, as long as it's quick. Can I start by taking your name? It's Selina Thompson. Is that T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N? Yes. Okay. Great, thanks. And what do you do for a living? Well, I'm an accountant, but I'm between jobs at the moment. I understand, but that's the job I'll put down on the form. And would you mind my asking which age group you fall into? Below 30, 31 to 50, and above? Over 50, <laughs> I think we can safely say. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks. And which type of membership do you have? Sorry, I'm not sure what you mean. Do you mean how long... Of no, is it a single person membership? Oh, right, no, it's a family membership. <laughs> thanks. And... How long have you been a member? Ooh, let me see. Uh, I was certainly here five years ago, and it was probably two to three years more than that. Mm -hmm. Shall I put down eight? Oh, I remember now. It's nine, definitely. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no problem. I've got that. And the last question in this first part is, what brought you to the club? Uh, sorry? Uh, how did you find out about the club? Did you see any ads? Well, I, I did, actually. But I have to say, I wasn't really attracted to the club because of that. It was through word of mouth. So you were recommended by a friend? <laughs> actually, my doctor. Oh. I'd been suffering from high blood pressure, and he said the club was very supportive of people with that condition, so I signed up. Mm, great. Thanks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation... You have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, for the second part of the form, I want to ask a bit more about your experience of the club. Sure. Uh, how often would you say you use the club? <sighs> it varies enormously, depending on how busy I am. Mm, of course. But on average, per month? I'd say it averages out at twice a week. OK, so eight on average. Yeah, and four of those are aqua aerobics classes. That leads me to the next question. Would you say the swimming pool is the facility you make most use of? Fair to say that, yep. Right, thanks. And are there any facilities you don't use? Hmm. One area I realise I've never used is the tennis courts. Mm. And there's one simple reason for that. You don't play tennis? <laughs> Actually, I'm not bad at it. Oh. It's that I'm not happy having to pay extra for that privilege. Oh, right. I've made a note of that. Thanks. Mm. 
<clears throat> Now, in the last section, are there any suggestions or recommendations you have for improvements to the club? Uh, only about health and fitness. Anything at all? Well, I'd like to see more social events. Oh. It isn't just a question of getting together for games or classes, but other things, you know. Yes, yeah, sure. And another thing that I was thinking when I had my yoga class in the gym last night, we were all sweltering in the heat, uh, was that I think they should put in, well, you know... Uh, Air conditioning. Uh, that's exactly what I mean. Mm. The rooms are really light and well-designed, but they do need proper installations. Sure. Well, I've made a note of that. Good. So, is there anything else you'd like to suggest? Uh, about quality of service, for example? Oh, everyone's very nice here. They couldn't be more friendly and helpful. Oh, but I tell you what, it's a shame the restaurant isn't open in the evening on Saturday. And Sunday as well, for that matter. Oh. So, the club should... Yeah, open it later on those days. OK. Well, thank you very much. That's <laughs> all the questions I have. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a telephone conversation about opening a bank account. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Expats Helpline, Terry Davies here. What can I do for you? Hello, Terry. I've been in this country for a while and I've just been offered a job in the city, so I think I'm going to need to open a bank account. I haven't had one before, so I'm wondering what papers I need. Well, basically, you'll need to be able to prove to the bank that you're who you say you are and that you live where you say you do, OK? Uh-huh. And for some banks, at least, that means you'll have to show them two separate pieces of identity. So I'll run through the list if you like. <laughs> yes, please. OK. I'll bring it up on the screen. Let's see. Here it is. Right. The first thing it says is a valid passport. Mine's Australian. Yes, that would be fine, of course. The next one is a driving license. And again, one from your country would be OK. Then that's followed by birth certificate. Oh, hang on. That's only if you're under 18. Which I'm not. Right. So not that then. But you can also show them a benefit book. For instance, if you're in ill health or unemployed or getting income support? Yes, I could bring that. Or a letter from my employer, maybe? Well, that's not actually on the list, so we'll have to assume you can't. OK. And to prove where I live? Again, there are several possible things listed here. For instance, you could use a bill for council tax or something else for where you live, such as an insurance certificate. I've got one of those somewhere among all my papers. But what about bills? Things like phone bills, I mean. As long as it has your address on it, yes. Fine. So a bill for my mobile would do, would it? Uh, I'm afraid it would have to be for a fixed line phone. You could use other types of household bill, though, as long as you get them through the post. How about an electricity bill? That'll say where I live, won't it? If it's in your name and not that of a landlord, yes. It is, so I'll probably take that then. There's one other you might want to use, a vehicle registration document. If you have a car or motorbike or something, of course. No, I haven't, actually. Now, 
I believe there's a bank actually inside the commercial centre, and I might open an account there, seeing as how that's where I'll be every day. Yeah, that would seem to make sense. I know people who bank there. I actually read about it in a city guide. My cousin picked it up when he was here a couple of years ago, and I made a few notes. Do you mind if I run through them with you now, just to make sure the details haven't changed? Fine, go ahead. Okay, first question. It's still a branch of the popular bank, is it? The one with links to Australian banks? No, it's actually been taken over by another big banking group, the Savings Bank. It still seems quite popular, though, especially with people doing business in the Asia Pacific area.、Mm. And when is it open? Monday to Saturday? I'll have to check their website for that. Give me a second or two, will you? Sure. Right. I've got it. Customer service, and it's just weekdays, I'm afraid.、Mm. Does it say what their business hours are? I'm just looking for that. It's on a different page for some reason. I think there's been a change at some banks in the last year or so. Yeah, here it is. It's open from 9:30 in the morning till half past three in the afternoon. And it's on the top floor of the main centre building, is it next to the travel agency? That's where it used to be, but they've since moved it to a slightly bigger place. It's on the ground floor now. Oh, and one last thing on this.、Um, I know most banks give incentives to young people to open accounts with them, but apparently this one didn't. Do you know if they're offering anything these days? I'll just check. I'm sure they'd say so on their new clients page if they were. No, there's nothing mentioned here.、Oh, that's a pity. I was quite looking forward to getting my free gift. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions eighteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions eighteen to twenty. There are plenty of other banks within walking distance. You know, it may be worth shopping around to see what they've got to offer. Longer opening hours, including Saturdays, perhaps less crowded. Can you tell me how to get to a couple of them? I know where the commercial centre is, so that's probably my best starting place. Sure. For the Royal Bank, you need to turn left when you leave the centre. Go along Market Street past the post office, and turn left up Bridge Street past the Shaw Theatre.、Mm. Then you take the first right. You'll see an internet cafe on the other side, and the Royal is just a bit further along on the right, directly opposite the Park Hotel. Okay, I've got that. Um, what about the Northern Bank? For that one, you turn right as you come out of the centre. And go along Market Street until you come to the junction with West Street.、Mm. There you turn right again and carry on up as far as the next junction, where you take a left. You'll see the bank from there. It's the third building on the right. Fine. And the last one,、uh, the National Bank. You can go either way from the centre, really, up West Street or Bridge Street, and then along past City Hall. The bank is on the other side of the road, right next to the tourist office. You can't miss it. Great! Thanks a lot for your help. Any time. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a lecture about the Miners Hotel. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Good evening and welcome to the Minor Hotel. We are pleased to have you as our guest. I will give you a brief information session to tell you everything you need to know to make this a pleasant stay. The Minor Hotel was built in the 1850s, during the Gold Rush period, also nicknaming our state the Golden State. People from all over the country and even from other countries came to seek their fortune here in these hills, creating cities overnight. In this city, many Gold Rush hotels soon opened up. This particular hotel was built in 1851, but was destroyed during an earthquake. It was rebuilt in 1995 to recreate the feel of the Gold Rush, complete with articles and actual photographs from during the 1850s. Our hotel is divided into two buildings, one called the Gold Tower, and the other is named the Fortune Tower. You will be staying in the Fortune Tower on the 25th floor, complete with great views of the city. Your room is the best room in the hotel, complete with private living room and hot tub. Here is your room card. On the card it will say FT, meaning Fortune Tower. On the bottom of the card it will say 2515. The 25 stands for the 25th floor, and the 15 stands for the 15th room on that particular floor. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. There are emergency exits in both towers of the hotel. They are located on the south side, opposite the elevators. Please use these in case of a fire or other emergency. We have some special events happening this week. Our Miner's Diner is offering a special Miner's Buffet dinner this Friday and Saturday for only $20 per person. This special includes all food, not including drinks and alcohol, and shows for the night. The buffet will be available from 5 to midnight. Because of the historical significance of our hotel, there are some special rules. The first rule is that there is no smoking allowed anywhere in the building, not even in your own room. This is not only to ensure the safety and health of our guests, but also the furniture and pictures can be easily damaged by smoke and other harsh treatment. Please remember that there are items of furniture over a hundred years old here, so respect the rules by not smoking. Secondly, please do not take pictures using a flash of any of the drawings and paintings in the rooms or hallways as they are old and fragile. We are doing our best to preserve a national treasure, so please help us in doing so. Lastly, you will only have one set of towels and bed sheets per three days. This is to conserve the water supply, as there are frequent droughts this high up in the hills. If there are any further questions, the staff of the hotel will be available to answer your questions. In the event that no one is able to answer your questions, I will also be available from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. each day in the concierge. I hope you enjoy your stay here with us. Thank you very much. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk about the tall ships race in Britain. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In July 1956, a fleet of 21 sailing ships from 11 countries raced each other from Torbay in Devon to Lisbon. The ships had been converted from cargo carrying to sail training ships. However, their future seemed uncertain and the purpose of the gathering was to mark the passing of the age of the sail. What happened instead was that the sailing ships refused to say goodbye and two years later they raced again and the fleet was even larger. It was then that the title The Tall Ships was given to them and the name remains today. The original organisers, the Sail Training Ship International Race Committee, now called the Sail Training Association, saw that a new international movement had begun, adventure training under sail. As race succeeded race, it became clear that the events had more to do with bringing adventure and widening the horizons of young people than of commemorating the passing of sail. Now, sail training ships began to be specially built and young people from all walks of life wanted to participate. Now, to compete, a vessel has to satisfy just three requirements. It has to have a minimum waterline length of 9.09 metres. Half its crew must be between the ages of 16 and 25 and its principal means of propulsion must be a sail. Since 1972, the race has been sponsored by Cutty Sark Scott's Whiskey and it has started to attract huge crowds of spectators. In 1984, more than 250,000 people lined the River Mersey in Liverpool to watch the fleet set off. And in 1986, two million spectators joined Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth at Newcastle-upon-Tyne to watch the parade. 1989 was the year that the spectacular Cutty Sark Tall Ships Race started from London. A grand fleet of up to 100 vessels gathered on the River Thames near Tower Bridge on Tuesday the 4th of July. The only thing that the racing yachts, ancient and modern, had in common was their young crews. Few were expert sailors and the majorities were strangers to the sea and to each other. Between Tuesday the 4th of July, when the fleet began to assemble, and Saturday the 8th of July, when the ships took part in a grand parade of sail down the River Thames, vessels were berthed on either side of Tower Bridge. Some were moored in the Pool of London, opposite the Tower of London, while others were moored to the east of Tower Bridge. Smaller vessels were accommodated in St Catherine's Dock. Many of the larger ships were open to the public. It was an amazing and historic spectacle as the ships sailed slowly up the River Thames. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.